This algebraic geometry lecture will be about rational functions and rational maps. So let's first define rational functions. Suppose y is an affine variety. Then we have the coordinate ring O of y, which you can think of as being all polynomials on y. And this is an integral domain because y is a variety. So we can form the quotient field or field of quotients, which is sometimes denoted k of y. And we call these rational functions on y. For example, if y is the two-dimensional affine space, its coordinate ring is just the field of polynomials in two variables. So its elements are just polynomials in X and Y. And the ring field of rational functions on Y is the field of all rational functions in X and Y, which is usually denoted by round parentheses rather than square brackets. And its elements look like rational functions, so it would be some polynomial divided by some polynomial, where, of course, this one is not identically zero. Um, so um, the analog of rational functions for Riemann surfaces are just meromorphic functions. So if we have affine varieties and Riemann surfaces, then um, regular functions on affine varieties correspond to holomorphic functions on Riemann surfaces, whereas rational functions correspond to meromorphic functions. So meromorphic functions are the quotient, field of quotients of holomorphic functions, and rational functions are just the field of quotients of regular functions. Now let's look at what happens if y is a projective variety. So now we're going to take y a projective variety. And this time we can't do the previous construction because the ring of functions, the ring of regular functions on y is just um, the field we're working over. So we've seen this for the projective line and it's not too difficult to check for other projective varieties. So the quotient field, the field of quotients is again just k, which is far too small. Um, this is really uninteresting. So we have to define rational functions on a projective variety in a different way. So instead what we do is we say a rational function is given by, first of all, a dense, um, well, let's take it to be affine open set, just for simplicity. So it's going to be a dense open set. And secondly, a rational function on U. Um, except um, we need to say when two rational functions are the same. So if you've got two rational functions, let, let's call this rational function F. So suppose you've got a rational function given by a function F1 on a set u1 and a function f2 on a set u2, these are um, identified if um, f1 equals f2 on um, a dense open set contained in um, u1 and u2. So if you know about direct limits, you, you can say the rational functions um, is got by taking the direct limit 
um, over dense open affine sets U of the ring of rational functions on U, which I will just sloppily call K of U. Um, and any two dense open subsets um, have form a dense open set. Um, so it's not too difficult to check that the rational functions on um, on our variety X, which we denote by K of Y again, form a field. Again, we're taking Y to be an irreducible variety. If, it's, if Y is not irreducible, people don't generally define rational functions. You can define rational functions on algebraic sets that aren't irreducible, but then the rational functions don't form a field, so it's a bit more complicated. Um, now we can define rational maps between varieties. So suppose X and Y are varieties. Um, as before, they can be uh, algebraic sets, but people don't usually define rational maps for algebraic sets. So um, a rational map from X to Y is a regular map from U to Y, where U is dense and open in X. And we identify um, so if it, we identify two of these maps in the obvious way. So if we've got um, a regular map F1 defined on a set U1 and a regular map F1 defined on a set U2, we say these are equal if F1 equals F2 on an open set U contained in U1 intersection U2. So when I said open, I said these should be dense and open. Um, so for example, rational maps from X to the affine line are the same as rational functions on X. And now obviously the next thing to do is to form a category whose objects are varieties and whose morphisms are rational maps. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. Rational maps do not form a category. Category. And the reason for this is that composition need not be defined. And it's quite easy to find examples where the composition isn't defined. We can take a rational map from A1 to A1, um, just taking everything to zero. And then we can find another rational map from A1 to A1, which just takes X to one over X. So the image of this map is the point zero, but the domain of this map doesn't contain zero. So the composition is just not defined. So rational maps and on varieties don't form a category. However, you can modify this. We define a rational map to be dominant So a dominant rational map means the image is dense. Or the image contains a dense open set more precisely. Um, and then if you stick to rational maps whose image is a dense open set, then the composition is now well defined. So for example, this map from here to here, the image is zero, which is not a dense open set. So we're not going to count this as a real rational map when we form a category. Um, now, um, now that we've got a sort of category, we define two varieties to be birational if they're um, equivalent in this category of rational maps or rather dominant rational maps. So we say X and Y are birational. It means we've got rational maps from X to Y and Y to X. 
such that the composition of this and this is, well, it might not be the identity map of X because it might only be defined on a dense open subset, but for rational maps that counts as being the same as a dense open subset. So this is a cruder relation than saying they're isomorphic. So if they're isomorphic, meaning there are regular maps between them whose that are inverses of each other, then they're obviously birational because regular maps are rational maps. But there are plenty of examples of varieties that are birational but not isomorphic. Um, so being birational is a sort of cruder equivalence relation than being isomorphic. So let's see some examples. So suppose we take the varieties, the affine line, the projective line, the hyperbola xy equals one in the affine plane, and the curve x cubed equals y squared. So we've seen earlier that these four varieties are all birational to each other. So A1 is P1 minus a point, and this hyperbola we've seen can be identified as A1 minus a point, and we've seen there's a, um, a map from A1 onto this variety, which is an isomorphism on a on A1 minus a point. Um, however, no two of these varieties are equivalent. So this one has a sort of singularity um, and um, this one is A1 with a point removed and this one is, is P1 with a point removed. So they're, they're not the same as each other. Similarly, we've seen some two dimensional varieties that are birational. We can take P1 times P1 we can take projective space P2, we can take A2, and we can take A2 minus the origin. And these are all birational to the plane A2. So these both of A2 is a dense subset, and this is just A2 minus a point. Um, but we've seen that no two of these varieties are isomorphic. So these are not isomorphic, they're birational. Um, well, the next question is, are there any varieties of the same dimension that are not birational? Since almost all the examples of varieties we've seen so far are birational to the affine plane. Um, well, that's because we've just been looking at the easiest examples. It's not too difficult to find examples of um, varieties that are not birational to an affine line. Um, varieties that are birational to an affine space are called rational varieties, by the way. So we want to find a non-rational variety. And in honor of Fermi, we will look at the elliptic curve x cubed plus y cubed um, equals one. So it kind of looks like this. And we're going to show this is not birational to the affine line. Um, more generally, there is no um, dominant map. There's no dominant regular map. Uh, no, sorry, no dominant rational map. from the affine line onto this curve. Um, so if we had a map from, um, suppose we had a map from A1 to this curve, which is dominant means it's not constant. What would th this would mean we had um, rational functions, x, t, and yt with xt of q plus yt of q equals one. Here we're using t as the variable in A1 and x and y for the coordinates of this curve. So x and y are rational functions in t. And we want to show that x and y have to be constant. 
Well, clearing denominators, so X and Y are going to be polynomials divided by polynomials. So by clearing denominators, we can find F of T cubed plus G of T cubed equals H of T cubed, where now F, G and H are polynomials. So you see, this is very much like Fermat's last theorem for exponent three, except instead of working with integers, we're working with polynomials. And we're trying to show there are no non-trivial solutions where the trivial solutions are where f, g, and h are all constants. Um, well, we can assume these are co-prime. And now, um, Let's work over the complex numbers or some algebraically closed field. And now we can factorize the left side as saying it's ft plus gt times ft plus omega gt times ft plus omega squared gt equals h of t or cubed. So again, this is what you do when you're trying to solve Fermat's last theorem over the integers. And now the polynomials over a field, so the polynomials over this field form a unique factorization domain. So um, these three are all co-prime and their product is a cube. So this must be a cube and this must be a cube and this must be a cube. Strictly speaking, um, we should say these are a cube up to units, but the only units are constants. And since we're working over an algebraically closed field, any constant is also a cube. So we don't really have this problem. So we can call this H1 cubed, H2 cubed, sorry, H2 cubed, and H3 cubed. So we get three equations, F plus G equals H1 cubed, f plus omega g equals h2 cubed, and f plus omega squared g equals h3 cubed. Now, these are linear equations between f, g, and the cubes of the h, so we can eliminate f and g from these three equations. And um, what this is going to do is it's going to give us a linear relation between h1 cubed h2 cubed and h3 cubed. Um, and by multiplying by constants, we, we get another relation between, so if we multiply h1, h2, and h3 by some constants, we get another relation between polynomials, which says the cube of one plus the cube of a second is equal to the cube of a third. Well, now we found another equation of this form, and you notice that if f, g, and h are not constants, then h1, h2, and h3 have smaller degree than f, g, and h. So, so this gives us a new equation, h1 prime cubed plus h2 prime cubed plus h3 prime cubed, sorry, equals that, where these this is h1 times a constant and so on. So this gives a contradiction because for any solution of this equation, we get a solution of smaller degree. Um, you notice, by the way, that this works for any exponent that is at least three. It fails for exponent two, and in fact, the result is false for exponent two. For instance, we have the equation one minus t squared squared plus two t squared or squared equals one plus t squared squared. And this corresponds to the fact that x squared plus y squared equals one is rational, as we saw in lecture one of the course. And in fact, the um, the, the, these polynomials here, of course, just come from the rational map from this to an affine line. Um, the reason the proof breaks down here is that h1, h2, and h3 no longer have smaller degree than f and g, so the induction fails. Um, so um, Fermat's last theorem for polynomials over an algebraically closed field is completely trivial. Um, you can give a proof in a few lines, um, whereas for 
the integers, it's incredibly difficult. And you know, Wiles' proof is about 100 pages long. And the reason for the difference is that um, polynomials over a field are very much nicer than the cyclotomic field that you have to use for Fermat's last theorem over the integers. In particular, polynomials over a field form a unique factorization domain, and all units are, are nth powers for any n. That's why the proof is so much easier than for the integers. And um, by the way, there's a much shorter proof using a bit more algebraic geometry that there's no rational map from a1 to this curve x cubed plus y cubed equals 1. What you do is you notice this curve has genus 0, and this curve has genus 1. We'll explain what these mean later on. And it's a general result that there's no map, non-constant map from a curve to a curve of higher genus. So if you know about the genus of a curve, there's a sort of one-line proof that, 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 that there's no rational map from A1 onto this curve here. OK, the next lecture will have a different proof that x cubed plus y cubed equals 1 is not rational. So what we've done now is given an algebraic proof. Um, the next lecture will give um, a sort of topological or analytic proof using elliptic functions.